Hello everyone and welcome to the Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Voris today and for the next three episodes, which you'll see Holy Thursday, Good Friday and Easter Monday, we're going to bring you the talk in Scranton from last weekend, which was the source of so much controversy. We've divided the talk into three parts of roughly 15 minutes each and are making it available for your viewing for free because the Diocese of Scranton, in cooperation with the Archdiocese of Detroit, ordered that the talk not happen on church property. It had to be moved back a week at the last minute, resulting in a change of flights, which ended up costing an extra $1,300 because of the cancellation fees and the short turnaround on the new flight reservations. So if you'd like to help defray the additional costs associated with the change of plans, we'd ask you if you could to please help out by purchasing the complete presentation of the talk on a single DVD for $5. All we'd ask you to do is just please click right over here to get further details. And if you're watching on YouTube, please go to realcatholictv.com and click on the link for the Vortex. Thank you for all the hundreds upon hundreds of communications stating your support and encouragement over the past couple of weeks. And now, on to the talk that was the source of so much controversy, Living the Catholic Faith Radically. A blessed and holy Easter to all. Everything about Catholic teaching is so wedded together and so interconnected with itself that you simply can't accept part of it and reject another part of it. It all fits together. You cannot talk about the Catholic priesthood exclusive of the Eucharist. You cannot talk about the papacy exclusive of, 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 of hell. You can't speak of any teaching of the church without at some point doing the six degrees of separation to any other teaching. You all know that thing with Kevin Bacon and the six degrees of separation? Well, there's about two degrees of separation with everything in Catholic teaching. That's why you can't separate them. You cannot stand, have someone stand up and say, you know, I support the church, but you know, a woman has a right to choose. No, she doesn't. You cannot support that and be a Catholic. You simply can't. And it's not because of politics. It's not because, oh, this party and that party, well, this party over here does that. That's ridiculous. There's lots of things you can't support as being Catholic, but murdering children in the womb certainly is not one of them, or rather is one of them. Because it's connected to the dignity of the, of the human being that God created. All of this, all of this, how you be Catholic has got to be radically in love with Christ. There is no other way to be Catholic. And I keep stressing be, not, I'm not, not am, not I identify, not I check the box or when I'm filling out some form, what religion are you, I am this, no. You must be Catholic in the sense that St. Paul quoted a Greek poet 500 years before him when he said, in him we live and move and have our being. Our being. Everything about you must be radically, to the root, Catholic. It's the only way to be because that's what love demands. And after a while, the demands of love fall away and it becomes joy. It becomes joy. Remember those first loves? Even if it's not with the person you're sitting with right now. <laughs> Remember those first loves, even if it was in second grade or fifth grade? Or what did you do every day? Where is she? Where is she? When you were with her, oh, I said, oh, yeah. When she got up, hey, I'll go with you. When you got married, you know, when you're, remember way back, you got married. Those first few, well, maybe days, but weeks or months, 
slip those little notes into his lunch or, you know, leave little phone calls or, you know, all of a sudden you just come home with a dozen roses. Because that's what love is. Love's crazy. Love is crazy. When you're in love, you're nuts. And everybody knows it. You don't want to be out of the person's presence. When you're out of their presence, you're dreaming up the fastest way to get back in their presence. You leave notes on the toilet seat, little post-it things, thinking of you. Kind of a strange place to think of you, but okay. <laughs> you get in the car and there's a post-it note on the steering column. Have a nice day, love you. Because this is what you do when you're in love. Everything about, well, if we love somebody like that who eventually winds up disappointing us and then we have to kind of rebalance ourselves, God never rebalances himself. He loves us like that forever. He loved, that, he loved us like that before he even created us. God's jumping up and down in heaven right now creating somebody. He loves them so radically. He's, oh, I can't, oh, I can't wait to, for you to come into existence physically. You're already in existence in my heart. You always have been. But now I'm going to knit you together in your mother's womb. I'm going to breathe my life into you. And I'm going to want nothing except for you to come back to me. I love you this much that I want you to come back to me and love me this much back. And then we will be happy forever in eternity. How does that get transmitted? That love gets transmitted through the Catholic Church in its fullness. Because that's why he set it up. He set it up like that. He established it like that. What did he say to Paul, Saul, on the road to Damascus? Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is already up in heaven at this point. He's been up in heaven for, who knows, two, three, four years, whatever the time frame was. He's already risen from the dead, spent 40 days here on earth, and ascended to heaven. What's he talking about? Why are you persecuting me? And to make the point... When Saul says, Lord, who are you? He says, it is I, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. How could he be persecuting Jesus when Jesus is in heaven? Because Saul is persecuting the church. And that is the body of Christ. And when you receive Holy Communion, oh yeah, you are literally the body of Christ. Paul abandoned, for the most part, the Old Testament reference, which would have been very common in his day, of the people of God. And that's true. Certainly the people of God. But more than that, more than that, we are the body of Christ. The physical body of Christ when we receive Holy Communion. For you mothers and fathers out there, who have younger children. Reflect on this one beautiful thing for a moment. When you go up and receive Holy Communion and you go back to your seat and you have your young child beside you or perhaps in your arms, when you look out on that child, that's not just your eyes anymore looking at your child. Those are the eyes of our blessed Lord also looking at your child. When you hold them in your arms, those arms, because the DNA of God has mingled with yours, is mingling with yours physically. The angels in heaven who right this minute behold the beatific vision, they see God in the face are not as close to God as you are when you receive Holy Communion. The angels can't get that close. It's a beautiful line in the Old Testament where God says, it is my delight to be with the sons of man. 
It is my delight to be with the sons of man. That's how much we are loved. And so he comes to earth and he walks around for 32, 33, whatever years. And he doesn't want to leave. So he wants to stay with us. He wants us to have access to the truth. What did he ask those first century followers of his? He asked them to make an act of faith. Many, many times in sacred scripture, our blessed Lord, somebody will come to our blessed Lord and say, you know, Master or Jesus, you know, heal me, heal this person over here. And very frequently, Jesus' response is, before he does it, do you believe? Do you believe that I can do this? And the answer in the affirmative, and he does it. Our Lord demands faith. Just a little faith. Just a little faith. The size of a mustard seed. That's all he demands. Why? Why does he demand that? Because that's your investment. So he says, if you believe, I will do this. What does he ultimately ask his followers to believe? He asks them to look through the veil of his humanity and believe in his divinity. And every single person that he comes across must make that choice. And we see numerous accounts of that in sacred scripture. He turns to the apostles at one point and says, who do people say that I am? And they give him all the crazy answers. You know, John the Baptist back from the dead, Elijah, blah, blah, oh, the people say this, the people say that. Uh -huh, that's very good. Who do you say that I am? They get pretty quiet pretty fast. Well, uh, gee, uh, oh, you did that thing with the storm on the lake. That was pretty impressive. Um, not sure. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, says Simon. And the second person of the Blessed Trinity turns to Simon and says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For not flesh and blood has revealed this to you, but the first person of the blessed trinity. My Father, who is in heaven. So since he gave you this grace to see through my humanity and recognize my divinity, which I share with him, for my part, as the second person, I say to you, you are Peter, I change your name. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. <laughs> Applaud Jesus. <Go> ahead. <laughs> Do you see the relationship now all of a sudden? That the revelation of the Father through the Son to a man who looks at his humanity scrapes away, peels back the humanity, and sees the divinity and announces it, that act establishes the Catholic Church. It doesn't come into visible reality until Pentecost, but that establishes the whole plan right there. And moreover, I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The connection between the church and the will of God is identical. And this is why you cannot reject the teaching of the church without rejecting Christ. It's not possible. And that goes for people in the church, especially for people in the church who refuse to acknowledge the connection between the official teachings of the magisterium and the will of God. That is what it is. For clerics, 
or anyone in charge, anyone who has any sort of authority in the church to deny, downplay, push aside, ignore, refuse to preach about a teaching of the church. How dare they love those people less than God has commanded them to love those people. They have no business withholding the truth because the truth is Jesus Christ. But that's what they do. Too many people in the church, too many people in the church do this. This same Peter, who acknowledges the divinity of Christ, finds himself out on a boat with his other apostles, his other friends, and they see each other in this big storm, and all of a sudden, across the waves, comes a figure walking on the water to them. And they all freak out. They forget about the storm, because now it's a ghost. It's a ghost. Ah! And Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's me. And Peter, because Peter recognized the divinity of Christ, Peter says to him, Lord, bid me that I should come out and walk to you. What? Everybody else in the boat. Imagine that conversation. Peter, you're high. <laughs> Simon, you're an idiot, even when we were children. Get back. What are you doing? It's stupid. Shut up. Don't be ridiculous. Nobody does that. He's walking here. He's getting closer. He'll be in the boat soon enough. But he reaches out, puts his leg over, his foot on the water, and starts walking towards Christ. And then he takes account of the wind and the waves, and he starts to sink. He loses sight of the divinity of Christ, which he had professed earlier, and still believes, but not enough. See, belief has to be total, or it's either going to move to totality or move away from it. It's one or the other. Nobody stays in a half-love situation. Not forever. You increase in love or you get out of the situation because of all of the demands that love has. So up there at Caesarea Philippi, Peter recognizes his divinity, announces it here in the boat. He recognizes it enough to go walking across the water, and all of a sudden, whoosh, a big wave <laughs> kind of gets blown over a little bit. He takes account of the wind and the waves, and he begins to sink. Too many, many people in the church today, including leaders of the church, have simply taken too much account of the wind and the waves. The duty of shepherds is to protect the flock, not take a poll and figure out which of the gates they're going to open to let the wolves in. It is not to sit and dialogue with the wolves. It is to protect the sheep. Or give them honorary doctor degrees. <laughs> Too much dealing with the world. Too much dealing with the world. And the world is happy to have that dealing because now when you look back over the carnage of the last 40 to 50 years, where are the people? Where are the parishes? Where are the vocations? Where are the young Catholics at Mass? Where are the Catholic weddings? Where are the Catholic baptisms? 
how come all your money is drying up? Because you have slept with the world and taken your eyes off Christ. That's what's happened. Every single time in the history of the church, some horrible heresy or horrible practice seizes hold and takes souls away from the truth. Every single time that happens, it always happens and begins, originates with somebody who is in the ordained class, not the laity. Martin Luther was a priest. Arius was a priest. Every single time something goes wacko in the church, it goes wacko because of somebody who has a collar around his neck or a mitre on his head. And if that sounds insensitive, you don't understand what it is to be Catholic. <laughs> now, is that a challenge? Sure, it's a challenge. Archbishop Fulton Sheen said, who is going to save our church? Do not look to the priests. Do not look to the bishops. It is up to you, the laity, to remind our bishops to be bishops and our priests to be priests. In the 1950s, in the 1950s, what many consider sort of the halcyon days of Catholicism in America, when Bishop Sheen's television show Life is Worth Living was the number one show on TV. Knocked Milton Berle out of the number one slot time and time again. Imagine that. A Catholic bishop standing there in his robes and his cape with a chalkboard and the truth for half an hour expounding on the glories of Catholicism, the number one rated show on TV for three years. My, how the mighty have fallen. How the mighty have fallen. For him to have made that comment, what did he know? He said in the 1950s that before the turn of the century, missionary priests would be coming to America to shore up the church over here. What did he know 50 years ago, 60 years ago? Right in the middle of Father Bing Crosby. <laughs> right in the middle of Father Barry Fitzgerald with the bells of St. Mary's clanging away and Sister Ingrid Bergman taking care of the nice children in the schoolyard. They must have thought he was nuts to make a comment like that. But see, holiness always knows what's going to happen because holiness sees the full truth. This is our goal as Catholics to embrace the fullness of the truth, never deny it, always defend it, always defend the truth. If it costs you your life, especially if it costs you your life, defend the truth. But if it costs you aspects of the way you live, defend the truth. A good soldier does not fight so hard because he hates what's in front of him, but rather because he loves what's behind him. God bless you all. Thank you.
Please help us keep delivering these kinds of messages that so desperately need to be heard and acted on. Join RealCatholicTV.com today as a premium subscriber. Become immersed in the faith established by Jesus Christ. The Catholic Church is the only hope against evil because that is its God-given mission. As our Lord said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Join RealCatholicTV.com today as a premium subscriber and come to learn and love Christ more deeply.